We're good to go? Okay, thank you very much. Um, I didn't know the mic was on earlier, so apologies for that. <laughs> I'm Amina Bakr. I'm a senior research analyst with Energy Intelligence Group. Very excited to be here with uh, my esteemed panelists, and we'll be talking about a very um, relevant and uh, topical issue of uh, the evolution of carbon markets. Um, as you realize, there's a huge mandate by a lot of uh, energy companies, including ones in the Gulf, primarily Aramco, to, have, uh, to reduce their emissions. So carbon markets are going to play a big role in that, and we'll understand how the practicalities of it, is it possible, and where we are today. So with us today is Riham Ilgizi, CEO of Voluntary Carbon Markets. Riham, welcome. Diego Sanz Gills from the founder of Panchama. Welcome. Reham, I want to start off with you. Um, there's a lot of skepticism around carbon markets. It's kind of uh, the Wild West area for, for some. Um, Talk us through what you did with the voluntary market, where we are, and we heard recent announcements as well, really exciting announcements, uh, which I'll leave you to, to tell us the details of. All right. Uh, oh, my voice is too loud. <laughs> Put it down. Uh, well, I, uh, yesterday, His Royal Highness uh, Prince Abdelaziz, together with the governor of PIF, announced the launch uh, of the... Uh, exchange, our exchange, and it's going to be launched in COP together with a trade transaction. Uh, so this is what we're going to do uh, next in the coming uh, 12 days, so we're counting down. My team has uh, got a big counter and we're counting it by the day. Uh, I want to talk about the carbon markets in specific and where they are right now. Uh, the status of the carbon market uh, right now, after a lot of uh, questions around integrity of the sum of the project, mm. We're seeing the demand in the beginning of the year, in the middle of the year coming, becoming soft, mm -hmm. but and then it's coming back stronger right now. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to do a transaction. It's going to have more than 16 Saudi companies. We're talking about uh, budget airlines who are going to join us. We're talking about Aramco, Sabic, and that's a demand signal. Uh, and this is going to be in COP? Yes. Okay. It's going to be at COP. It's a finance COP, mm -hmm. and this is what we wanted to do. Is there a date for it, Raham? Yes, it's on the 12th. Okay, so we need uh, to follow November. that up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so this is the status of the market right now. Uh, I think whatever we're having uh, when it comes to integrity is very good news mm. because it's making everybody very uh, aware of the problems and it's making project developers more cautious uh, into their, the quality and the integrity of their projects. It's making registrars and their setters scrutinize uh, their uh, projects as well. And then at the end of the day, it's making uh, the supply, the, the, the buyers uh, double check what they are buying. So it's really good for the market because we cannot afford not to have that market. It's a very important tool mm -hmm. uh, in the journey to net zero globally. How do you get around the issue of pricing? Because that's something that comes up a lot and how do you price it? Is there uh, a benchmark? So how, how do you deal with that? Well, I, I don't want to advertise for our company. It's a Saudi company. It's 80% owned by PIF, 20% by Saudi Tadeo. The problem in the market is 80% of the trades are done over the counter. So price transparency is a very uh, a particular issue in the market. Uh, it doesn't help suppliers to find uh, in, in their financing, project financing specific, because you don't know what is the right price. What we're doing in the company, we have three... Uh, business units. One of them is the exchange. And exchange is designed around price discovery mainly mm -hmm. because everything is done over a spot exchange. So mm -hmm. it helps to reach the price discovery point uh, and then creating the indices. And afterwards, when you accumulate enough data, you move into the secondary market and you have future contracts. So that is when it comes to an exchange. We have an investment arm and we have advisory services as well to complement. I'm going to ask you more about that, but I want to bring Diego here into the conversation. And uh, Diego, at this conference, we've seen a lot of emphasis on how Saudi Arabia wants to invest in AI and the kind of direction the world is going into. I mean, we're seeing robots everywhere. So how could AI or satellite imaging uh, help carbon markets? Thank you for having me. I am co-founder and CEO of Pachama. Pachama is a technology platform that 
empowers companies to confidently invest in nature-based carbon mm. credits projects. Mm -hmm. And the technology piece is precisely a combination of AI and satellite data. Mm. Today, as you know, with uh, reusable rockets, we have hundreds, thousands of new satellites uh, orbiting the planet, taking images of every corner of our, of our planet. And with AI, we can process all that data and come up with models that allow us to verify how much carbon is being sequestered by natural ecosystems, mm -hmm. to look at the history of an ecosystem, to predict what's going to happen in the future. Mm. And with that new data, mm -hmm. we can ensure integrity and transparency in this mm. new generation of carbon projects. As you mentioned, integrity has been an issue in the yeah. first generation of carbon markets, mm. but these new technologies are really here to change the game. And you can game. certify that. There is some kind of certification, or uh, well, how does it work? We have been working with the certification bodies to in include these technologies on the methodologies. Okay. But we also work with uh, several groups, including academics and you know, universities, to validate the accuracy of these models. Of course, you, you still need ground truth. You still need people to go and do audits on the ground mm -hmm. that you use to then validate the accuracy of these models. Mm. But these models mean that you can do now very large analysis. You, know, you can look at the entire Amazon rainforest. Mm. and estimate the carbon sequestration that happens in every corner of it. So that's going to really change the game. It's going to bring a new trust that is very needed to unlock a new wave of investments from corporates and from financiers that want to uh, unlock this new supply. Apart from the shortcoming, which you just mentioned, of actually having to send people down there on the field to kind of verify again, what other shortcomings of this technology can you identify? Yeah, I mean, definitely we see that companies are doing more due diligence, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they are running RFPs. Mm -hmm. They want to see all the range of projects from nature-based solutions to engineer solutions. They want to be able to compare apples to apples mm -hmm. in this new uh, world of more scrutiny. Mm -hmm. and, and for that, also software uh, can power what today is called DMRV, Digital mm -hmm. Monitoring, Verification, and Reporting. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, digitization of the sector is something that's happened rapidly mm. and, and it's really going to empower companies to make better decisions. Things that were done before by consultants mm. in a very manual way now are going to be done in a more scalable way. Interesting. Um, Raham, I was at a panel this morning. I'm not going to tell you uh, which bank this individual works for, but there was a lot of skepticism around carbon markets and financing carbon markets to the point where this person said that uh, their bank does not back it because they don't believe it's, uh, it's going to grow. So we heard about, uh, I mean, you had an auction in, in Africa, now you're going to go to COP, etc. Where do you grow from here and what kind of, I mean, the challenges of financing uh, carbon markets further, how do you deal with that? I, uh, I love the question and I like your comments a lot and I agree with you on a lot of things. I'll, I'll go back to, I think the problem in the market right now, everybody would say it's demand mm. and I disagree. I don't think it's demand, I think it's supply and it's financing supply. Mm -hmm. I think it's a big problem in the market uh, and I think if you, if you were to look about it, and if you say that this market were skeptical about it, I would disagree. And let me give you an example, and I talked to a lot of advisors and consultants. Mm. A lot of companies came out and they announced their targets by 2030, be it net zero, mm. be it uh, reduction of emissions. Sure. And the majority of these companies specifically European and American companies didn't meet their targets, they're not gonna meet it by 2030. Mm. So it's either they go out right now to their investors, to their shareholders and to the public and say, we're not gonna meet these targets, or the other way around is to complement their decarbonization uh, plans. Which way is it going? Where, where do you think this offsets. is going? I mean, are, are they- Decarbonization uh, is expensive right now. There has been inflation, there is an economic crunch. So. Some of them have delayed their decarbonization plans. How are you going to meet your target? You're going to meet, meet it by complementing that with carbon offset. Why is mm. carbon offset very important? Mm. And this is what we never look at. It's financing those projects that are uneconomic, mm. 
mm. without carbon credit offset as a revenue stream. Mm. So these projects will never happen unless we have carbon offset as a revenue stream for them. I'll give you an example of a kelp. If we have mangroves, what is the revenue stream coming from mangroves? It's carbon credit offset that we can sell right. to companies that are lagging behind in their decarbonization journey. So I strongly disagree with him. Mm -hmm. I say, or her. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I disagree. I say carbon offsets and mm. carbon credit market is here to stay. Mm. And I think the problem is never in demand. Mm -hmm. The problem is in financing supply. And if we don't start financing supply, carbon credit offsets are going to be too expensive even mm -hmm. uh, for companies to afford them. And where do you go from here post COP, uh, post the big transaction that you're, you're planning? Um, what other auctions are you, uh, please give us a kind of sneak peek. So we have our partners, Marta standing up, but she helped us, she's standing, <laughs> she's sitting down now. Right. But we have a lot of partners that are gonna sit down with us and we have a lot of public consultation. Uh -huh. We're designing contracts to be traded, we go to London. So we design the exchange with our partners. We have different partners, sorry I embarrassed you. Uh, but uh, we sit together with different experts, be it sellers, buyers, traders, credit agencies who design contracts. Mm. Next year, we're launching our finance, uh, Islamic finance. So we're the first country. So halal and carbon neutral? Okay, what a combo, two labels. We had, uh, we had uh, two fatwas <laughs> from two uh, Islamic banks. One of them is the ISDB, Islamic Development Bank to allow it for carbon credits to be a backing commodity. For those who don't know, Islamic finance happens by a backing commodity. Utility What's the size price, of that gold. finance? How do you scope it? I mean, opening that door so into, yeah. I'm sure you've talking, done your studies. I, I love that. In Saudi Arabia, it's half trillion dollars a year. Okay. The size of the carbon market is less than two billion. Mm -hmm. So imagine if you opened 1% in it, how would that be? Yeah, so, huge. Yeah. yeah, so half trillion dollars in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. But if you go beyond that to the Islamic nations, we're talking about $2 trillion a year mm -hmm. of Islamic trade. That could be backed, part of it is 0.1% is backed by carbon mm -hmm. credits mm -hmm. rather than gold, rice, or steel, mm -hmm. or other metals. Then you open up uh, another way for financing projects. Mm -hmm. And this is something we're going to uh, go hand in hand. We're going to launch mid, ne mid next year is our contracts to mm -hmm. be uh, exchanged, um, will be traded on our spot exchange mm -hmm. together with the Islamic finance. We're partnering with the SMB, mm -hmm. Saudi National Bank for that. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of activities that are going. Uh, I, I think the launch of the exchange is just the beginning of a journey of expanding and growing. So we'll stay for tuned here for today. that. Diego, I'm sure you want a slice of this uh, huge uh, Islamic uh, finance. And I'm gonna pose the same question to you. How do you get investors excited about this? Yeah, so the question about demand is an important one. Mm. Definitely in the last 18 months, there was a contraction of demand for carbon mm -hmm. credits yeah. as a result of um, negative press revealing shortcomings of the first generation yeah. of carbon markets mm -hmm. and also as a result of uncertainty around the economy, the interest rates increases, made companies to s slow down the very accelerated pace of purchases mm. that we were seeing from 2015 to 2022. Mm. But as you say, demand is here to stay. 40% of Fortune 500 companies have made a commitment to net zero. Mm. They're not backing away from these commitments. Mm -hmm. In fact, these commitments are increasing because mm. we're seeing the big AI scalers, Microsoft, Amazon, sure. Google. We're hearing about all these huge data centers too data and how that's demand gonna climb. Yeah. Increasing their emissions mm -hmm. forecast, yeah. meaning that now they're going back to the drawing board to say, okay, we need more to compensate now and the demand is returning. Mm -hmm. And um, now the demand is changing in the sense that now a lot of companies are looking for certain types of projects, particularly removals, for example, mm -hmm. that don't exist in the market. Mm -hmm. And that means that companies are going and sign off-take agreements where they commit to purchase the credits in the future mm -hmm. at a given price. And that is a really good signal to then get the financing for the projects. So I would say that right now, it's kind of like a contrarian moment to come in and invest because mm -hmm. of the uncertainty of the last 18 months. Mm. But I think that uh, 
the demand is here to stay. The supply needs this unlock. And I'm particularly very excited about what's to come. And, and it's a global, inherently global market, right? Mm. The projects are all over the world. The demand is in the global north, in the Middle East, mm -hmm. where these big emitters need to compensate. And I think that the projections that two years ago were being seen on the press that this could be a trillion dollar market probably are still true. Uh, it's going to happen in the 30s, mm -hmm. but this is the moment to invest. Absolutely. Um, and I'm glad you brought up the issue of uncertainty. Part of that is uh, related to policy, government policy. I'm going to throw you a bit of a curveball here, uh, Reham. I mean, the results of the U.S. elections has a, is a topic that always comes up, and we always ask, how is that going to change um, the, uh, the attitude towards the energy transition? What is that going to mean globally, et cetera? So wh wh what do you think? Um. I mean, we need to be realistic. Mm. Uh, we need to affordable energy. So we're in climate. We need to find solution uh, to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. But still, if I talk about Africa, I went and cooked an open fire, and I told you about that. I'm not, it's it's mm. crazy that 40% of the population don't have access to electricity. Mm. I mean, they over should, a billion people. Yeah, that's I, that, I mean, it's unbelievable. So energy poverty is in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, in other parts of the world, uh, access to clean cooking stove and, and so on and so forth. LPG is here to help and other renewable. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is we need to advance on all fronts, but we need to be aware as well of countries' needs, specifically Global South. Mm -hmm. This is something that be aware of. For the U.S. government, kudos to them, they issued a paper, the Biden administration mm -hmm. issued a paper about carbon markets. They were pushing for it. Mm -hmm. You had the Secretary of Energy, Secretary of Agriculture, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, the Treasury, mm -hmm. everybody signing to this and saying, we support the carbon market and we want to see these things happening across the carbon market. And this mm -hmm. is a strong statement from the U.S. administration. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think uh, if the results of the election between Republican or Democrat happens, mm. that would change the, uh, the, um, the uh, whatever administration is there. Mm. Their views about carbon market is here to stay and uh, the North America, the US carbon markets. Mm -hmm. I first worked on carbon markets in the US. Okay. So, I mean, uh, it's here to stay again, regardless of the administration uh, that is uh, in the US. Diego, you operate in several countries. You mentioned Brazil as well as, as others. What policy changes do you think would need to happen to further enhance uh, carbon markets? Yes. Um, we operate in Brazil. Time back to the previous question. We recently announced a fund formation in partnership with Patria, with this, which is mm -hmm. the largest private equity firm in Brazil, mm -hmm. that is seeing the opportunity to invest in reforestation projects in Brazil particularly. And in Brazil, we're seeing a lot of um, government uh, movement towards regulating and giving more clarity to carbon markets. Mm -hmm. The forestry department is about to give a big concession of public lands with a 50-year uh, visibility of secure contracts mm -hmm. to foster investments into reforestation across the Amazon, but also in the Atlantic forest. And, and we're seeing other countries doing the same. Indonesia had a, a moment of confusion mm. last year, but now it's back at giving clarity that yes, carbon rights are rights that we're gonna respect uh, strongly. And, and I think that, yeah, the countries where the projects can exist are seeing that they need to give regulatory clarity for foreign investors to come in and invest. And then the countries where the demand is, countries mm. like the US and Europe and mm. Singapore mm. and Korea and Canada, are seeing that they need to also bring regulatory clarity to their companies. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we're starting to see you know, this emergence of compliance markets that are merging with voluntary markets, mm. where many companies are going to be basically forced to compensate their emissions. Mm -hmm. And I think all those are things in the right direction. Uh, every COP, uh, there is more alignment around, you know, Article 6. Mm. And I think that, you know, sometimes progress feels slow on the regulatory side, but mm -hmm. it's always in the direction of giving more incentive to invest in this market. 
Thank you, Diego. Unfortunately, we ran out of time. Uh, I can easily sit here for an hour with both of you talking about this, but uh, key takeaways, carbon markets are here to stay. Uh, there's a lot of demand and they're needed. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Raham. Thank you, Diego.